I thought it might assist if I approach the topic from the perspective of a non-executive director and the sorts of things I see through the eyes of the people I have the opportunity to mentor uh, who are themselves looking often to be uh, directors in the future. I'll draw on some of the material that Jennifer took us through because by total happenstance, or it might be related to the fact that I rang her ahead of time, some of my comments tie in with some of her research, but it was really a fantastically structured paper, Jennifer. Congratulations. So I guess it might help, I hope, if I divide my comments into three parts. The first on building and sustaining a resilient career and a satisfying career at that. The second on the internal and external barriers that we all face in that regard. And finally, the third one in deriving an individual leadership style. So on the question of building a resilient and satisfying career, I was delighted to be able to read an article over the weekend that put the essence of that sort of career better than I could. And it's an article by one of my favourite writers, Bernard Salt, will be known to many of you as social editor for The Australian and demographer at large. And he described the successful career as one that had both hard skills, technical skills, and soft skills. The hard skills, of course, with the academic training where appropriate, and the key technical skills, depending on the role, and treating those as necessary but not sufficient. He then went on to discuss the soft skills and how, in a sense, they are if anything, more important than the hard skills. He described them, in fact, as the flotation equipment that keeps you um, buoyant in troubled waters of one's career. And these soft skills were things like building relationships, having the emotional maturity to grapple with a difficult conversation and not bear a grudge afterwards, um, enjoying the work having fun, working extremely hard, those range of interpersonal skills that we recognise ourselves in others around us who apparently sail through life more happily than others, but it's always an effort for all of us. Gail Kelly uses the expression generosity of spirit to capture that same sort of being the best person you can. And I think the way in which Bernard described that sense of hard skills and soft skills is a great thing to remember. And that notion always that we need to be continually developing ourselves in that regard. One of the associations I'm pleased to be a member of is Chief Executive Women. And it r runs the Leaders Development Program for upper, mi upper middle managers and focuses on precisely those sorts of things, negotiating skills, how to ask the difficult questions about a pay rise, um, how to sort of have your voice heard in a situation where the predominant majority may not be espousing the same views. And those sorts of notions of ongoing learning, I think, are critical to careers. The other thing I've found, and it's part of the luxury of being a non-executive director, is the ability to be able to serve on a range of companies, not only in the commercial world, and some of my re most rewarding times have been through service on medical research institutes such as WEHI, arts bodies, um, educational institutions such as the University of Melbourne, the Melbourne Business School. And that is because in those places, particularly say with research scientists, I was chairman of the Australian Synchrotron for example for five years, in those sorts of places you get people who are motivated by the greater good, the cure for cancer, the cure for diabetes. And there is that sense of a higher purpose in what they do. And I think to the extent to which your career can have an element of serving a higher purpose, it means that the perturbations along the way can be contexted in a much easier way, I think. That was the first topic. I hope you enjoyed it. Here comes the second topic. <laughs> Barriers, internal and external. Apropos the comment I made about being an um, adherent to the notion of ongoing education, 
I had a spare week in May and I took myself off to Stanford to do an executive education course which was on women's leadership. And as part of that, we had some terrific lectures. It was a group of 60 women, many from Silicon Valley, um, a number from uh, countries all around the world. I was perhaps, um, without technically being a grandmother, the grandmother of the group, um, but all sorts of seniorities. And it fascinated me that the stories uh, we told in the classroom, particularly from the younger women, were stories, you know, I felt I was reliving my own career in part. So. Uh, plus ça change, plus ça la même chose. The more things change, the more, things, the more they, they stay the same. Um, one of the case studies we were talking about was Heidi Royson. Now, Heidi Royson was a successful entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and the class was given um, a description of her career, and it emphasised how well she'd done by uh, her technical competence and then building up networks and building up her businesses. And then the class was divided into two parts. One were given Heidi Rosen's, Royson's case study, and the other were given an identical case study where the protagonist was called Howard Royson. Many of you will know it. They were then asked to rank how they found the competence, um, the likability, and the, um, some of the other personal attributes of each of the candidates. And it rather goes to some of the points Jennifer made earlier about the distinction between the nurturing style of leadership and the authoritative or de de decisive form. So anyway, equally you'll be pleased to hear, and perhaps not entirely in line with some of Jennifer's research, competence, both of them came out give or take um, equal, save only of course Howard was a bit more. Howard won hands down on likability um, whether he'd make a better employer, uh, employee, I beg your pardon, um, what a team member he'd be. And the only scores that Heidi won out and out were um, power hungry, <laughs> disingenuous, and some other garth, ghastly thing that was sort of French for ambitious, but, but you know, was the flip side of, of it. So that was a fascinating exercise for all of us. And we, in fact, then debated in the classroom this issue of decisive on the one hand being, you know, the natural measure of leadership as traditionally perceived and women's natural nurturing roles and how do you reconcile them. And it goes back, in a sense, to something I said a moment before about the benefit of being involved in organisations that are responsive to more than a commercial imperative, science research institutes, whatever because a number of the research findings were that women, when they were their own advocate for a pay rise or in their own position, in fact found it quite hard to ask for what they wanted. And they in fact were perceived to be less pushy if they were not doing it for themselves but were doing it for the organisation in a sense. And that notion that they were responding to a higher purpose for the industry, for the organisation, for their team, in a way enabled them to get away with being decisive. It's not a long-term solution, but in terms of something that seemed to work for individuals, it was quite an interesting paradigm, I thought. One of the other academics whose work we studied was, uh, has the unforgettable name of, of Baba Schiff. And Baba Schiff, who was, um, what was he? He was a neuroeconomist, first one of those I'd ever met. Um, and he introduced us to the notion of the decisions we make in life that reflect whether we are actuated by a fear of failure, on the one hand, or a fear of opportunity lost. And of course, a fear of failure um, inclines us to say, no, I won't take that on. And a fear of opportunity lost says, yes, I'm going to do that and I'll figure out how later on I'll just say yes now. And he made the point, which was a novel one to me, that you're, we all have different personalities and some go for the fear of opportunity lost with their ears pinned back and you can all have a rest and needn't listen. But for those of us who are more defaulting to no, he made the point that if you find yourself in a circumstance where you are relaxed, confident, emotionally grounded, you are more likely to think, I don't want to lose this opportunity. But if you're feeling stressed, work's tough, kids are sort of arcing up, world's a mess, and someone says, how about go, going and working in San Francisco for six months, you're thinking, are you kidding? 
not a chance. So that aspect of evaluating your own emotional state in the context of opportunities that come to you is, I think, something really worth thinking about. Um, the final takeaway in relation to that period in Stanford uh, was a reprising for me of a book I'd enjoyed by Laura Liswood, who was a senior Goldman Sachs executive, Laura Liswood, called The Loudest Duck, so called because in China the loudest duck gets shot, and you know, women who speak up, you get the parallel. Um, and in a way, her work predated some of the work that Sheryl Sandberg um, produced in her Leaning In book. And in the context of The Loudest Duck, Laura wrote of things that one has to deal with being sometimes one's inner voice, which indeed might be one's grandmother's childhood message to one, which is that nice girls sit up quietly and wait, don't speak until they're spoken to and a bunch of things like that. But from time to time to be aware to the extent to which you have an inner voice that is not productive, that in a sense you should learn to listen to it, evaluate it and ideally silence it if it's going to hold you back. So I thought that as a sort of compass for dealing with external and, inter and internal barriers, a useful sort of exercise. Finally, the issue of a personal leadership style. This time of year you have more board meetings and order committee meetings than you need and the net result is you see your directors across all your companies for hours and weeks and months on end and I've just been more or less through most of that session and I was struck last week by um, when we were having a long session together one of the directors on one of my boards starting to tell his personal story. We were talking about appropriate team behaviour. He described the period when he was a manager of a company and there was a need to lay off staff and his division needed 80 people laid off and others of his um, peer executives needed to lay off 20 or so and he felt it deeply and it was a direction from on high and it was non-negotiable and he went through the exercise and found it quite gut-wrenching in terms of, you know, loyal and able people but, you know, that was the market's impact. And then after they'd all been through this bruising for the executive, obviously laying off, incredibly bruising for the um, people laid off, after he'd been through this exercise, he said, the CEO said, now we're off um, on a strategy um, session together. Meet us at Tullamarine tomorrow morning, nine o'clock. We'll be away for four days. So he did what he was told and they get to Tullamarine then they get to Hayman Island and they go on two yachts. So they're sailing in the Whit Sundays, and there's no radio, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, mobile connection. And this fellow director of mine said, he didn't use this expression, but he had such cognitive dissonance around the notion that his people needed him. He couldn't answer their calls, he couldn't hear what circumstance they were in, and they were floating around having a good time. And... After a day or so, it got to the point that he couldn't stand it anymore and he went to the CEO and said, I want to go back. And they said, well, we'll drop you at a beach. So he got dropped <laughs> at a nearby beach. Um, Anna, you'll probably know the beaches and whether this is practical. And he, in fact, um, uh, arranged for a helicopter at his personal expense to fly him back to Melbourne. And the next day he was in the office and counselling and dealing with, you know, the myriad issues of can I keep my car and what will I tell my wife and my husband and, you know, my mobile phone, etc. And then when the rest of the executive team came back, he was called into the CEO's office and the CEO said, look, that wasn't really good team behaviour. <laughs> net, net, the guy thought he didn't relate to the team that behaved like that and moved on to other things and has done extremely well. But that sense of having your own moral code around the way in which a CEO or any leader acts is, I think, a really important element um, of the way in which we conduct ourselves as leaders. Two other things I just wanted to say. For anyone, when you first become um, elevated to levels of senior management and leadership, or indeed many times throughout our career, the imposter syndrome cuts in. And the imposter syndrome, of course, is that little voice that says, what are you doing here? How can you have this sort of corner office or title or whatever it is? 
Um, and this can be reinforced by um, circumstances. But, and this actually got airplay when I was in Stanford. And the issue of dealing, everybody has the imposter syndrome is where you should really start in life, even Barack Obama, the whole lot. Um, but, you know, people hand, handle it differently. But when it ha happens to the individual, it's a real issue. And one of the ways of handling it, I think, is to say, you know what, I'm now chairman of this organisation or I'm the CFO or the CEO and people are looking to me to undertake this role in a way that facilitates each of them doing their jobs. It is in a sense that um, contexting it in the higher calling of what the organisation needs, and I think it's an extremely helpful way of embracing the role and living the role and knowing that every day you go forward, you're being the leader in your own style, but you owe it to people to not um, resile from the importance and um, responsibility of the role. My final comment on my third, third section, you've applied yourselves very good, well and listened very intently, thank you, um, is the notion of being your authentic self. Um, a little while ago, Gail Kelly spoke to a number of us and she described the amusing circumstance where she went for a first senior role at um, Nedbank in South Africa when she was the mother of three um, five-month-old triplets. And she described how she left one with a mother and then she left one with a receptionist and she had the third one who was on her knee as she went through the interview. Blew me away. I totally agree. You're all looking astonished. I was too. But the point she made, and it's a really good one, when you got her, you got her whole family. So that notion that you bring all of yourself to work, all of yourself into your positions, and you don't have a work me and a private me um, is, I think, a terrific message on which I might end. Thank you.